Hi, this is Roger from Kanka Labs and today we're going to take a look at this uh, so-called antenna matchbox or simply matchbox. Um, we will uh, not only explain uh, what it's uh, used for but also take a look inside, reverse engineer it and make a few experiments with a frequency generator and an oscilloscope to see what it really uh, does with uh, receiving signals and what it's good for. Um, this one here is an, in a German import, it's called DE32. I think this is, uh, although here it's uh, Tiking and Koch, uh, that's the German uh, importer probably. Um, I think this could also be from the designation DE35 from the well-known uh, Chinese firm Degen, which uh, manufactures also um, shortwave radios, etc. Well, first of all, what is it good for? Uh, this becomes clear when we take a look at the back. Um, we have a uh, for the receiver and for the antenna, uh, two types of connecting, a so-called PL connector or two clamp terminals. Uh, so uh, at this terminal you, um, you put your antenna uh, into, you connect it, and the output terminal is for the receiver. There are also antenna matchbox for transmitters, but this small one here is only for uh, receiving signals. So, and um, the, match, the, the purpose of the matchbox is to match the impedance of your antenna to the impedance of your receiver or transmitter, if it would be a, a matchbox for transmitters. And for that purpose, we in the middle, we have a frequency range switch. And then to the left and to the right, uh, we have two variable capacitors. So we will see there are not potentiometers behind, but variable capacitors. And what it makes uh, quite interesting is this, um, this little switch here, which is called Q selector. So apparently uh, we could guess that um, this is a bandpass filter or, or it not only matches the impedance of your antenna to your receiver, but also that uh, the, the passive uh, components inside uh, make a resonant circuit and thereby you probably can select um, the Q factor of the bandpass filter. We will make a few, not only uh, take a look inside, but also make uh, some experiments uh, to see the effect of the Q selector uh, switch that's will be quite interesting now before I first opened uh, this device my guess how it works was the following so my guess was that it would work the following we have uh, the input and then we have a the first variable capacitor going to ground and then comes uh, a switchable coil or impedance for the different frequency ranges and then we would have the second variable capacitor and then the um, the output connector <clears throat> so th this is what it's what is called a Collins uh, filter uh, you should not mix this up with the uh, Collins quartz filters. This is the passive classical Collins filter. And that's what in every textbook you can read uh, how an antenna matchbox works. But there is uh, nothing here where we could put the Q, fac uh, the Q selector switch. My guess was that perhaps they would switch uh, a resistor in parallel to uh, the the uh, to the inductor here to the switchable inductor. Uh, but now let's let's open this thing up and take a look inside and see how it really uh, works.
So, um, to shorten it up a bit, I've already um, uh, unscrewed the four screws of the uh, metal case made out of steel, apparently, sheet steel. And well, now, uh, no big surprises. Here we have the two variable capacitors. Uh, we have here the inductor with many tabs, but if we count the tabs, there are less tabs on this um, on this coil than we have settings here on the band selector or frequency selector. Um, so here we can on the on the range switch we can also see there are some little extra inductors. So the reason is uh, this one here tunes from 150 kilohertz, with, which is the the lower end of the uh, AM radio uh, band up to 30 megahertz. Uh, that is the end of the classical shortwave band. And uh, for such a big range, uh, you need also a very big range of uh, inductivity in your tapped inductor. And you cannot get this with one inductor. It would become extremely large for uh, the uh, lower frequency bands where you need some millihenries of uh, inductivity. Uh, so um, just to, to keep this uh, relatively cheap and relatively small, they apparently decided uh, to use uh, a relatively high quality uh, coil for the higher frequency bands and uh, to tune the lower frequency bands just with fixed inductors. Um, what you cannot see very well here is what's at the, uh, at the Q selector switch. There are a few um, capacitance, uh, capacitors soldered to the single taps of the rotary switch. And uh, what I can read is here three picofarads, so they are very, very small in value. And so it's not a resistor they put in, um, they put in parallel to the inductor. Apparently they are using capacitors. And um, let's see in a moment um, what the circuit diagram looks like after I uh, re reverse engineered all this. There's one thing that's a little bit annoying. Uh, it's um, usually you, you use uh, a, a ceramic body for, for these uh, air coils or solenoids or however you want to call them. And this looks and sounds like, if you tap on it, this is not ceramic, uh, this is, looks like plastic. And that's not a very good practice uh, because a plastic has much more uh, losses than uh, ceramic. Uh, so here they saved some money and did not use material of the highest quality. But anyway, um, you don't get any um, high quality variable capacitors um, with with um, which only uh, use air as a as the dielectric. Of course, these are the cheaper and still today readily available plastic film variable capacitors. So it's just a compromise between uh, how much this thing uh, can cost or uh, what a customer will be willing to spend for it and what is readily available in parts. So now let's uh, let me take uh, let's just take a break and I will uh, develop the circuit diagram and then let's take a look um, how the Q factor switch here is really working. So this is a, a little bit simplified circuit diagram that I developed after testing all the connections where they are going to. And what we already know is that we have here the classical Collins filter. Uh, we all in all have uh, the, the band selector rotary switch, all in all has nine taps for nine different frequency bands. 
Uh, six of them are realized with the air coil and for the three lower bands they have um, fixed inductors. Um, they have used fixed inductors. What, what I didn't, uh, just to make it, not to make it more complicated, we also have a pass-through um, slide switch which uh, just connects the uh, input directly to the output and bypasses all here this Collins filter. And the Q selector, that's quite interesting. Uh, on the, it has four positions uh, named A, B, C, and D. In the A position, uh, there's simply no effect. So the uh, signal is just going uh, straight to the first tuning capacitor. And uh, on the other three um, positions, there are these very small um, ceramic capacitors of very small value. And to see the effect, you, now you could also um, use LT Spice just to simulate the circuit. But uh, to show the effect of the Q selector switch and of the tuning uh, capacitors, we'll just uh, hook this up to a, a frequency generator at the input. And the trick that we make is um, um, frequency generators usually already have 50 ohms output impedance. And um, we just uh, put an extra resistor here in series so we do not directly connect the, uh, the frequency generator to the input. We, we simply mismatch it by putting an additional series resistor of let's say I don't know, uh, 220 ohms, so we have all in all 270 ohms uh, input impedance from our source, which, which would be our antenna. And um, we load the output simply with a 50 ohm resistor down to ground. So that means uh, in our first experiment, the output is already matched because 50 ohms is the standard impedance uh, that is used in high frequency. So the first experiment will, will be simply we have a matched output but the input is not matched to uh, 50 ohms um, and then we'll, we'll see what happens when we turn the tuning capacitors and what happens when we um, uh, test the different positions of the Q selector. So let me start by explaining how the connections and settings are. Um, on the antenna input of the matchbox, uh, I've put a um, sine wave generator, uh, which uh, makes a frequency sweep just exactly from the frequency range that we have set here, from 1.7 to 3 megahertz. And it does this sweep in uh, 120 milliseconds. And um, I've already told you I've mismatched the input impedance uh, just by putting a series resistor of I think 220 ohms. So that all in all we have 270 ohms. The output is coupled on the one side directly to the uh, oscilloscope input here on channel one. And I've put a 50 ohm resistor um, just in a parallel just to load the output with the standard 50 ohm impedance. And now I've set the uh, oscilloscope so that it's, it gets triggered from the um, frequency generator from the sweep start and the, uh, we get all in all the 120 milliseconds um, sweep uh, time is displayed here because we have 10 milliseconds horizontal per division times 12 divisions gives us 120 milliseconds. So uh, what, what we see now is basically the, um, the frequency response uh, while we have set the, um, the matchbox till uh, still on bypass here with the slide switch uh, in position through. So we get a, a linear frequency re response. That's of course what we expect when we bypass the matchbox. 
Now let's uh, put this uh, switch to coupler so that now the antenna matchbox or the elements of the matchbox are put between antenna input and output. And what we see is now we get a low pass filter here because the, um, the frequency response drops uh, linearly here from 1.7 to 3 megahertz. So that's one effect of the uh, Collins filter that it's a uh, low pass filter so that the higher frequencies are just uh, rejected. Now let's see what when we turn uh, the uh, tuning capacitor 2 for the output so we, we don't see very much change. By the way the black lines here that's due to aliasing of the uh, oscilloscope but if I put the anti-alias filter on the response time is uh, not fast enough so uh, look this important as the frequency response and the, the black uh, vertical lines here they um, have no, they are not real. So the, when, when uh, setting the output knob, there is no big effect. When we turn, let's do this in a way that you still can see the oscilloscope screen. Uh, when we put the input knob, we see a much bigger difference in the change of the shape and the frequency. Of course, when we turn it fully to the left, uh, which would correspond to the lowest frequency of 1.7 megahertz, we get a, a very um, steep uh, or a, a relatively steep uh, low pass filter. And the highest frequency response is um, here on the left side. And we can change this. Um, slope to nearly linearly. So um, that, that is not very interesting. In fact, it now becomes interesting when we put the Q selector to position A, uh, to position B. It's now in position A, which means the uh, small capacitors in series, uh, they are bypassed. And now we put um, it on position B. And what we now see is totally different. Now we get a bandpass filter. And if we compare this with the bypass position, we even get a higher peak response. So a kind of uh, natural amplification simply due uh, to the, uh, that it's a, a bit of a resonant uh, tank circuit. We get a higher signal and we, with the uh, left capacitor, we can change uh, the peak response frequency uh, from the lowest frequency, 1.7 megahertz or even a, a bit lower. That's simply because the capacitances and the, uh, the in inductances inside they are not 100% exact, but anyway, uh, we get a, uh, in, a very interesting effect. We now can not only match the input to the output impedance, but we can also get a bandpass filter shape of the filter. And we even get at the uh, received frequency where we get maximum signal, uh, we get a higher signal then without the matchbox. You see the uh, peak amplitude now is lower when we bypass it than when we put the filter on. And because we have already matched the output impedance to 50 ohms, again we see the right capacitor has nearly no effect because it has nothing to match uh, because we already have 50 ohms. So let's try out the next position of the Q selector, position C. And we see two things happen. The, um, the uh, peak frequency of the uh, bandpass filter um, uh, drifts a, a bit to the right. We still can shift it 
nearly through the whole range, but now the maximum amplitude is has become smaller. And let's go back to position A. So you see we get with in position A, uh, in position B, a higher amplitude than in position C. And in the third position, so that's a bit like an attenuator effect. We have to crank up the amplitude. So again, we have the whole uh, tuning range uh, with our variable capacitor to tune the bandpass filter through the frequency band, but uh, we have a lower, uh, a lower total amplitude, so that could be useful if your input reception signal from your antenna is that high that your receiver uh, already uh, distorts the signal simply because it's too big. But mostly, now we go back to position C, you will be interested in having as high a signal as possible. And um, of course, the highest signal we get in position B. Uh, so the effect of the different capacitors that is put in series with the input in front of the Collins filter is apparently changing the shape of the frequency response from a low pass filter to a band pass filter and uh, depending on the on the value of the input capacitor um, either amplifying or attenuating your signal without any active elements so they are you saw it there are only passive elements inside so and that's uh, quite nice so uh, at least for me it was a, a nice demonstration of uh, what what you can achieve with uh, such a simple uh, matchbox um, you can reject unwanted frequencies and unwanted uh, signals which also could uh, distort your um, the the input stage of your receiver and depending on uh, the, uh, the value of capacitance you put in series with the Q-selector switch, you get either amplification or attenuation. But in any way, uh, you can uh, not only match the impedance, but also tune uh, to the received uh, frequency. And well, now let's, as a, as a final example, Let's see if we mismatch also the output simply by taking out the 50 ohm uh, resistor to ground so that we only have the 1 mega ohm input impedance or in this case 10 mega ohm because uh, I use a 10 to 1 uh, oscilloscope probe so that we are uh, loading the output with uh, only 10 mega ohms instead of 50 ohms. So now we have a double mismatched um, input and output. The input is not 50 ohms, it's uh, 270 ohms. And the output is also not 50 ohms, it's now 10 mega ohms. So that's some, some of the worst mismatches in uh, antenna to receivers that you can get. And uh, I've put all the switches back. Uh, we are here at uh, bypass. We have the Q selector also in bypass position, in position A. We have the same frequency band, 1.7 to 3 megahertz. And now let's see when we put the uh, antenna coupler or the matchbox. Ah, and now um, we also get a bandpass filter. And now see what happens when we now turn the right knob, remember in the first experiment where we put 50 ohms um, to the output, um, there was absolutely no or nearly no effect when turning the uh, tuning capacitor number two. And now we have a totally different behavior. Uh, we now also have a bandpass filter and now we can shift the, uh, the peak of the bandpass, the peak frequency, with the, uh, mainly with the right capacitor. The reason is um, that now the output impedance is, is 
very far away from 50 ohms. So now the input is nearer matched to 50 ohms than the output. And so now the uh, output capacitor has a greater effect than the input um, capacitor or cap tuning capacitor number one. You see the effect when turning it is much smaller and we even have to set it to the uh, utmost left setting to get the bandpass effect. But anyway, the range, how we can change the center frequency and the shape is uh, even in this totally mismatched input and output is uh, quite large. Let's turn, if we turn it totally to the right, then we again have only the standard uh, high pass behavior. And now when we turn both to, to the right, we can see a little bit of band pass, but here it would be much better to turn the input capacitor totally to the left. And now we can shift the band pass with the tuning capacitor number two with the output capacitor around. Now let's see when we put the, um, the little capacitors on the input with the Q selector on position B. Oh, that's interesting. Now we get a much steeper band pass uh, let's see again. We can shift and change the shape a little bit with the left capacitor. We, we don't reach the full frequency range, so there's a little... We cannot reach the, the uh, lower frequency end. Let's see with the right one if we can change that. So there is, as you can see, there is uh, just... A, a lot of um, influence you can have with with the uh, two tuning capacitors in combination with the Q selector. Again, let's s s compare this with the bypass position. And again, you see the signal peak is nearly double as high as when we have the um, with or without the match box. And let's try out position C. Yeah, that's what we expect. Again, we have nearly the same shape, but now we get an attenuation of the signal. And in position D, of course, a still bigger attenuation, but basically the same, the same shape. So that was uh, quite interesting for me just to see with a um, with two examples uh, and mismatched inputs and outputs, um, what the effect of, um, especially of the Q selector, that is not very common with, uh, because it doesn't belong to a standard Collins filter. And um, so the, the uh, purpose of this thing is not, as we could see, not only to match input to output impedance, but also to reject unwanted signal out of, let, let's suppose this is the frequency that you want to receive, here where we have a peak response, and the, the lower and higher frequencies out of the center frequency, uh, they are quite strongly rejected, and your signal is even uh, amplified compared to when you have no coupler, no matchbox at all. So that was it for today. Thanks for watching. Perhaps it was interesting for you. And uh, I say bye from Roger, bye from Kanka Labs. Until next time.